we begin. I'm thrilled to roll out the latest episode of the IBM Qiskit Live Quantum Seminar Series dedicated to you, the research and academic quantum communities. I am your host, Zlatko Minev from IBM Quantum Research, and today I have the a special pleasure and privilege of hosting Professor Mahio Block from the University of Rochester. Mahio received his PhD in physics from Delft University of Technology or QTech in the Netherlands, working with Professor, Professor Ronald Hansen. During his postdoc at UC Berkeley in the group of Irfan Siddiqui, uh, which is how we share some common ancestry, uh, Mahio developed a Qtrid quantum processor in superconducting circuits. In 2020, Mahio joined the Faculty of Physics and Astronomy Department at the University of Rochester as an assistant professor, where Mahio has started a superconducting circuits lab as the inaugural Levinson Shapiro faculty scholar. Hello, Mahio. How are you today? Hi, Slatko. Thank you very much for having me. I'm uh, doing well, considering. Yes, it's a, it's a real pleasure. And um, I think, Mahio, without further ado, I'm guessing you're tuning in from Rochester. Absolutely. Snowy Rochester, yeah. Snowy Rochester. Well, we do have a snowstorm here in New York as well and probably across the Northeast. So with that, Mahio, the stage is yours. Thank you. Um, and so I will talk today about uh, some experiments that we are ongoing at uh, my lab here in Rochester and then also some work I've done in my postdoc at UC Berkeley. Um, on controlling quantum information in multiple dimensions using superconducting circuits. And I don't know if it is the times and or perhaps not having given a talk for so long, but um, I'm having a hard time actually introducing our work these days. Um, and I don't think it's just because it's been a long time since I've actually given talks, but it's also because as a community in quantum information, I feel like there's um, uh, it's maybe shifting a little bit from, from how I used to think about uh, the motivation. And um, I feel myself, whenever I try to talk about my field, kind of taking two different positions. And I can sometimes switch positions depending on who I talk to or what the, what the context is. So I see a debate in quantum information science where on one end, there is what I call maybe the orthodox view on the field where people are really excited about the prospect of using quantum information for good stuff. And then as the field is getting you know, bigger and more people are coming in and more money is coming in, there are also the very skeptical quantum information scientists who are worried about hype and inflated expectations and false claims and quantum winter. And since I, depending on the context, keep switching between these views, I don't know whether I should start really skeptical or really enthusiastic. Um, but that's why I figured I just start with this debate as a good history of quantum physics uh, should be. And if I would give these two sides um, a face, I would say on one end, there is the skepti skeptical person who could say, as Einstein here, you should not play into the quantum hype, where the more orthodox interpretation is uh, Bohr saying, stop telling me what to do. And after acknowledging that this debate exists, I would take um, for this talk, the Copenhagen interpretation to uh, the quantum information science debate. And Slatko, I was actually curious if you could guess what, uh, in this context, uh, um, uh, the slogan is for the Copenhagen interpretation. Oh, um, well, let's see, what would Bohr have thought of? Um, well, you know, you just start with stop telling me what to do, or we're going to do it anyway. I, I, I'm going to let you roll ahead. <laughs> I was going to go with the paraphrasing of David Merman of the Copenhagen oh. Interpretation, which is shut up and fabricate. Um, so for the motivation of this talk, I will say that I'm excited to engineer complex quantum systems and try to good them, put them to good use. And with this shut up, I don't mean to say that the debate is not interesting. And so if you're kind of new to this field or you want to have some perspective here, personally, I feel like the, the real experts have a good a good understanding here, um, but depending on what you read, you might want to read up on some resources. And I list a few, maybe by Scott Aronson and John Preskel, um, with various level of uh, uh, of rigor. Um, and with that, I take the perspective that I'm enthusiastic about increasingly complex quantum systems and trying to uh, control them. 
So what would we uh, control these systems for? What would be some of the uses? Well, um, the community is large, is excited about roughly four things, maybe in addition to fundamental physics, that is quantum sensing, simulation, quantum internet, and quantum computing. And in recent years, we're really seeing a very big increase in uh, really amazing experiments that are doing um, this kind of quantum science. And so just to fill out a few blanks here, these are just experiments from the past two years, working on a variety of systems, ranging from uh, ion tracts to uh, MV centers, and maybe very recent results in um, gate-defined quantum dots, where they showed that two qubit gates could have extremely high fidelity, um, and maybe quantum internet with superconducting circuits, entangling two different uh, chips. And the reason why I want to start here is to say that in such a broad field, and there are so many interesting systems, and sometimes it might feel like a competition between these, but really I think that every system has its, uh, its unique properties that is amazing to see how uh, every field there is progressing. Um, and also, the use of each system is not really set in stone, because I could make a very similar uh, diagram, just looking at slightly different publications, and I have the same applications, but all the systems actually change around. And so, if you are um, tuning in as a young scientist wanting to get into this field, what I would say is keep an open mind into which system you're studying. There's really a lot of uh, positive cross-contamination here. And personally, I've worked on MV centers in uh, the quantum internet experiment here below, uh, and then switched to superconducting circuits. And superconducting circuits will be the topic of the talk uh, today, which is what I work on in Rochester. And then there is another reason why I flashed these uh, particular experiments here, because with the exception of the ion trap experiment, all of these experiments listed here, just from the past few years, have to some degree used quantum correlations, whether it is non-local quantum correlations or very complex quantum correlations in very large systems, to a degree that classical systems could never have done this. And as you see, they have done this for different tasks, for quantum computing, for quantum internet, or quantum simulation or sensing. And while the state of the field now is at a point where maybe you wouldn't really use these systems if you actually want to do a particular task yet, because most, in, in almost all cases, a classical system would still be able to do better. We are really, I'm hoping that we're getting to the point where one might. And that's the broad motivation why we want to scale up these quantum systems and try to study them and see what we can do with them. So for this talk, um, so let's go ask me, well, there are a lot of people probably familiar with superconducting circuits to so still give a brief overview. So that's what I'll do. And then I'll quickly dive into my uh, area of, uh, of interest there. A few experiments that we did where we tried to scale these superconducting qubit systems up to higher levels, turning them into qubits or qubits in this case, three level systems. Um, and then I'll talk about an experiment where we use those three-level system quantum processors to study quantum information scrambling. And then time permit, I will talk a little bit about the work I'm doing right now at the University of Rochester. Thank so you, Mark. To dive right in. Yeah, yeah, no, this is good. Yeah. And I think there was even also controversy over who coined the term shut up and calculate, whether it was Feynman or David Merman or someone else. So even, even that in itself is, uh, is a whole debate. <laughs> That's absolutely right. And what I'm told is that this is wrongly uh, attributed to Feynman, but it's actually David Merman, but I, I wasn't there. So uh, it depends who your friends are. <laughs> <laughs> that makes sense. I will, I will not take a statement there anyway. Um, all right. Um, it doesn't mean to say that uh, at March meeting, I, I won't be open to discussing these things. I, I do love a good debate. So. The superconducting circuits, um, as one example here, a chip that we made at, uh, at UC Berkeley, um, have really uh, shown a lot of very beautiful uh, experiments that I would kind of summarize as quantum optics on a chip. Um, the circuits consist of superconducting material defined on uh, maybe on silicon. And by making these uh, superconducting, they become low loss electrical circuits that we can then cool down to the ground state and quantize so that we can do quantum optics with microwave photons. And the huge advantage is that we can control the coupling, the capacitor for inductive coupling between these elements very well 
And therefore, we can get extremely strong coupling. And also, we can get strong nonlinearities, as we see in just a second. And so that's really at the heart of the success of this, um, this system. So the first element that uh, I would introduce is um, a cavity or a harmonic oscillator, um, which is, in this case, made of a coplanar waveguide uh, defined here with two boundary conditions. One are, at one end is short and at one end it's open. And you can think of this as a transmission line for microwaves. And if you simulate the electromagnetics, you see that there's a lambda over four resonance appearing. Um, that can be modeled as a lumped element LC circuit, a resonance circuit. And if you're more in the, uh, the traditional optics, you can also think of this as a cavity, two mirrors, for an electromagnetic field in the gigahertz range. We can measure these type of resonators by putting them in a dilution fridge and reflecting a signal off of them, collecting it back, amplifying it, and sending it to a vector network analyzer, where we see that for this particular system where we have eight resonators, you get uh, resonance features um, with very high uh, quality factors um, where the external loss, so these cavities coupling to the transmission lines can be much stronger than the internal loss. And these, while well, sometimes you actually are used to uh, also encode information, are typically used to read out our nonlinear quantum systems. And maybe just a quick, slightly more technical question here on the picture we see that there's you know each of the resonators is a, is a little squiggle a little resonator but you also have uh the kind of feed line here broken off with a capacitor in red uh, so that looks like another very low q resonator at some frequency would you comment on that you know it's frequency design choice a little bit yeah yeah for sure that's an excellent observation and a good question um i uh uh I will admit that there's actually uh, qubits hooked up to these resonators. And the reason why we, uh, um, why we broke this up is that it's actually a very low loss resonator itself that um, can suppress emission from the qubit through the resonators to the environment. So uh, it is a means to protect the information in the nonlinear resonator that we will see in just a second. Great. And I guess its frequency is also around 6.5 gigahertz or something like that. Yeah, so it's centered around the, uh, the readout resonators and it's far off resonant with the, uh, the qubit resonators to, uh, to prevent it from uh, emitting in that mode. Yep. Thank you. So we can take these electrical circuits and you can classically think of them as a magnetic field in the inductor and an electric field in the capacitor. And we can quantize this and you will find that you get a quantum harmonic oscillator with the degrees of... Uh, uh, freedom being the flux and the charge, and you can express the raising and lowering operators in this mode in terms of those uh, degrees of freedom. Now, this will give you a linear harmonic oscillator, which means that if you want to encode quantum information, for instance, in the lowest two levels, uh, you actually need to introduce a nonlinearity. And the common nonlinearity in the field is the Josephson junction that uh, consists of a tunnel junction between two superconducting barriers and an insulator that has a nonlinear inductance that we write in this symbol here as a cross. And then if you incorporated that in another bigger circuit, um, historically, two of the earlier ways in which you can define a two-level system here is to create a flux or a charge qubit where you encode the degrees of freedom are flux in a loop going clockwise or counterclockwise, or uh, electrons being on one end of the island here or the other. Now, at the time, um, this was a very amazing find, but uh, it turns out that we can do a little bit better and make circuits that are a little bit better protected against noise. And that brings us to the workhorse of most of the uh, experiments that you will see today, although there's other circuits on the horizon, but this is a transmon circuit that essentially encodes a nonlinear uh, mode in an LC uh, resonator where you have the energy in the junction much higher than the energy in the capacitor. And that makes it much less sensitive to noise than those other two uh, qubits that we had on the previous slide. And so a typical uh, system that we have uh, then is actually a cavity coupled to a transmon that is a nonlinear oscillator and therefore can be used as a qubit or a qtrit, as we will see later in this talk, implementing the canonical James Cummings Hamiltonian. 
And for this talk, we will mostly have the cavity far detuned from the trans mount such that we can go into the dispersive regime. Um, and we realize this dispersive chains coming simultaneously that we use for readout and control of the, of the qubit. Thank you. Thinking about the, con is there a question? Yeah, go on. Thinking about the control of these uh, systems, because this will come back as we start to go to higher levels, um, we can irradiate the transmont circuit with resonant light through the control line here, um, or resonant uh, electric fields that we can pulse. Um, and these uh, give us the generators of rotation in terms of these Pauli matrices, sigma X and sigma Y. Um, and if we turn on that field for a certain time, the phase determines the rotation axis. And if you uh, then exponentiate the generator of rotation, you get these beautiful Rabi oscillations that go on for a very long time. And on the order of a few tens of nanoseconds, we can implement logical gates like uh, a bit flip or um, pi over two pills here. And you can visualize this as some rotation on the block sphere here, um, because this is a two level system. There are also means to entangle these systems, and that's a, a very large field. There's different ways in which uh, this can be done. Um, I'm actually not going to go too much in detail. You can either capacitively couple them and then give microwave drives there, or you can have tunable couplers to make different qubits go in and out of resonance. Um, and what I will just say is that nowadays, these systems are very well understood. Uh, they are very well controlled. Here are some pictures of different uh, transmont-based processors from various groups. And some rough metrics are that um, the number of transmonts go up to maybe 127, as I think one of the latest IBM uh, uh, chips. Lifetimes range in the range of a few hundred microseconds to even milliseconds. And um, these are typical single and two qubit errors where uh, I try to give a rough indication. So if you have something better, then please forgive me there. Um, this might not be the most up-to-date. Uh, this is just to give an idea. And what we see is that an entangling gate, a two-qubit gate, is usually much harder to do and therefore has a larger error. Um, however, impressive this is, people do think that to, to actually get to uh, other quantum information applications, uh, we do need to improve on those. And so there's many ways in which you can go. You can try to reduce the noise. You can come up with new qubit designs. Uh, people do quantum error correction. Or another path to improve is to do multidimensional encoding. And the work by the Yale group doing uh, continuous variable or bosonic encodings is a good example for that. And QDITS is another example of how you could get more out of these systems. And that's what I'll be talking about today. So the idea of a QDIT is to encode information in the nonlinear circuits, not just in two states, but more states. Um, and the advantages are actually very well documented in theory, which is that they are hardware efficient, uh, that they give much lower complexity of the circuit, and that they allow for very fast control, specifically if you compare it to the linear modes. There are some examples uh, of advantages you get in error correction, gate compilation, and even in quantum simulation, there might be some quantum simulation problems that very naturally map to the um, uh, having more degrees of freedom per site. Many experiments have been done using these higher transmon levels, uh, but up until recently, most of those were focused on single QDIT experiments. Um, and so there was really a need for getting a universal set of gates on a multi QTRIT chip to get the ability to do multi QTRIT algorithms. And you'll see that the argument generally goes for arbitrary number of many level systems, but for this talk, I will focus on the three level systems for a while, and then later talk about the um, ways in which we can scale this up to even higher dimension. So how we think about multi-level control, um, at the very first level, what we do is we don't just um, apply uh, drive tones at one frequency, but we actually drive both of the transitions at the same time. And then using the same readout techniques that we have used using qubits, uh, provided that your resonator qubit coupling 
shift your resonators by a small enough amount per qubit excitation that you can resolve the three qubit states within a single drive pulse, you can actually beautifully read out all of the three levels and see Rabi oscillations in uh, three levels. And this has been established in the field uh, for quite some time. I want to think about for a little bit um, in how we generalize this idea of rotations in a two-dimensional space to three dimensions, because when you start to do Qtrid logic, this becomes important. So the Pauli matrices that are the generators of rotation for a qubit in the three levels uh, case, these become the Gell-Mann matrices as the generators of rotation. There are eight of them and four of them in particular look familiar because they really look like a drive in the one, two or the zero one subspace. And you can think of those as Rabi oscillations, kind of like a reduced qubit system. And we can easily access them by just resonantly exciting those transitions. You find that there are two of these that are completely diagonal. And it turns out that adjusting the faces of these microwave field drives allow us to apply virtual Z gates in the same way that we would for qubits. And then actually these other ones are two photon transitions going from zero to two that we can either excite directly uh, or we can kind of build them up from the individual rotation. So you don't need them. For universal control, this is an overcomplete set. And so in principle, with these tools, you can then start to build up the Qtrid gates the same way you would for qubits. But there is one problem, and that is that we would like, ideally, a rotation that is given this rotation matrix. But what we actually have is a drive that is A minus A dagger here, that if you do the rotating wave approximation and you truncate the space here, you get these additional terms that you can think of as off-resonant drives of the one, two transition if you try to drive the zero, one transition. Um, and this actually causes a level shift of the second state that you can think of as a dynamical uh, phase or a start shift on the two states when you drive zero, one. Now in qubit language, you can correct for this, you can minimize the leakage and you can correct for these phases using drag pulses but this only works for the zero and one subspace and it does not correct for any phase acquired in the two on the second state. And if you try to do Qtrid logic, that is actually a logical error. So when we come up with our gates, what maybe we actually- Maybe before I let you move too fast, uh, two yes. quick questions from the audience, uh, maybe two slides back when you introduce uh, the, the, the Gelman matrices. Um, is the one first question was, is there a, type of block sphere equivalent to visualization or picture? And I see you smiling. <laughs> yeah, that's beautiful. We keep asking ourselves the same question. And there's uh, the, uh, um, the short answer is it's not easy because it becomes highly dimensional very quickly in the same way that we don't think there's a good block sphere representation for a two qubit system or a two qubit entangled state. Um, I do think that there is a toroid, uh, like kind of like a block donut, if you want to, that can uh, represent a Qtrid state. I would not claim to kind of live in that uh, representation as much as I understand the block sphere, but it exists. Um, and then what you could also do is do what people in bosonic uh, encodings do and uh, uh, give the, um, the continuous variable representation of your, uh, of your state, um, coming up with Wigner functions or P functions or Q functions. And that could show the state of the, um, a continuous variable system, including a Qtrid. Mm. But it and, might not be as intuitive as a block sphere. Yeah. Yeah, that would be interesting. Um, great. Mm -hmm. Can I add one? For sure, yeah. So um, I think if you restrict your attention to half the space, essentially, where you only look at uh, purely real wave vectors with three states, uh, so you're, it's not a general representation because it won't admit complex uh, phases and complex wave functions. But if you only make the coefficients real, you can still map yourself onto a sphere because you know you get three basis vectors with three real coefficients with a normalization condition to one. And so it, it will look like you have, uh, it's not the block sphere, but it's another sphere. And a lot of the rotations kind of look, work the way you would expect. Um, so it has a lot of the similarities of the block sphere, but as soon as you're non-pure, you, know, you kind of lose that picture as well. Uh, 
that's a, that's a fun yeah. one we can chat about after as well. <laughs> Beautiful, for sure. Yeah. Great. Thank you. Uh, oh, and maybe a quick uh, question, if maybe you'll talk about this uh, from San. Uh, how, how do you measure the dynamical phase or the geometrical phase on idle states when driving one qubit subspaces? Beautiful. This is my next slide. This is a beautiful segue into this. Um, so uh, the way that we measure this is using a, a protocol. Um, the pill sequence here is actually for the dynamical phase that you acquire when you try to drive the one, two subspace. So it's kind of like the inverted picture of what I draw in the level diagram. Um, but in essence, what we do is we do a Ramsey experiment on the subspace that we don't drive and then apply an increasing number of pulses on the subspace where we want to characterize the dynamical shift from. And then essentially what happens is as a function of the number of pulses, you get a phase on the idling level. But because it's in a superposition there, you can actually measure that with a final pi of two pulse there. So you map that phase onto a population that you can then measure. And that is the, uh, the plot that we do here. And I don't think I mentioned this word yet, but the question uh, poser did. You note know that we do this eight in a period of eight. And that is indeed because there is a geometric berry phase, which means that, um, well, people tell you if you do a two pi rotation in your qubit, it's the same thing. But actually, if you have a second level, you could measure the, um, uh, the phase shift there. So you need to do it with period of eight to actually get rid of the geometric berry phase there. Um, and then you get this pattern here as a function of pulses. You get these fringes. And then we apply for every pulse a phase correction. And then at the right phase correction, you don't acquire an additional phase. And you know that you've corrected for it. Yeah. And so with that, we actually can do all the usual standard qubit calibrations that you do, but you add this particular phase calibration. And now we have a native gate set that can consist of the Clifford gates in the zero one and in the one two subspace that actually together with virtual Z gates gives you universal control. Yeah. So now one of the first questions we can ask is how well do these pulses perform? And while we don't have the standard tools for qubits available, we actually set out to develop randomized benchmarking for these Qubit gates. So when you have the rotations, you can think of the logical gates, which are the Qubit Pauli operators. Uh, they can be generated by identity, this X gate that is essentially summing one modulo three to your state. And then a Z gate here that has these faces on the diagonal and they make up the, uh, the Pauli group. And for those who are interested, you can decompose the Clifford rotations in zero, one and two, one subspace into an arbitrary Qubit rotation. So with that, we can implement also arbitrary Clifford group for Qtrits. There are 216 Clifford rotations in a, um, uh, for a Qtrit system. Um, and then we have generalized the idea of qubit benchmarking to Qtrits. And as a function of uh, Clifford depth, we can measure how well we do for some random sequence. Um, and we see that actually the Qtrit pulse fidelity uh, it's not that much lower than the individual 0, 1 and 1, 2 subspace uh, pulses, which is good news because it means that going to this higher level at least does not extremely degrade the, uh, the single pulse fidelity. These pulses are close to the coherence limit. We use 30 nanosecond pulses, which is relatively long because we had significant crosstalk in this device. And the average number of native gates per Clifford is around 3.3 which is a point of improvement because we think that not having these gates as the native gates might help us improve there. Now, of course, we want to create entanglement as well. And what we did is we actually generalized the cross resonance interaction that, for instance, IBM is using on their machines, which is a microwave driven gate between two transmons that are capacitively coupled. Uh, so at static detuning. Um, where one drives the control transmon at the frequency of the target transmon. And in a simplified model for, three, for a three-level system, what happens is that depending on the state of the control, you get a Rabi oscillation on the target in only the zero one subspace. This was actually our hypothesis. We didn't know this for sure, but we checked it in the experiment and it turned out that this was quite close to what's actually happening we can choose our drive amplitudes in such a way that um, we set the frequency of the zero and the two conditional rotation to be equal. 
And then in this case, after 125 uh, nanoseconds, you see that the target subspace has gotten a pi flip only if the control was in one. And that is a two qubit logic operation that you can then use to create entanglement. So we went down to do this. It turns out that the canonical Qtrit entangled state is called an EPR state, 0, 0, plus 1, 1, plus 2, 2. And then with two of these conditional pi pulses that we build up using the cross resonance interaction, we could create a state fidelity of 0 0.98, which is pretty high. We were pretty happy with that. Um, the pros of this gate is that it's very fast and that we can use it for state preparation. Mm -hmm. A downside is that the simplified model turned out to be not completely true. So there's some additional phase accumulation here. That means that the actual unitary that you implement is not as nice. Uh, and that makes this um, more work for the future to actually generalize this to a universal gate. Um, another downside is that it only limits the interaction. So it doesn't do anything to the two space. Whereas usually this rich future dynamics, if you could do a gate in the whole subspace at once, that might be more efficient. All right, could you say again, uh, what are these additional dynamics or how much do we know about what's what that is? Roughly speaking, I think there is a conditional phase gate on top of this conditional rotation. Um, and it is not trivial to see what this is going to be. It depends on the detuning and the, uh, the frequency at which you drive. And if you don't account for that, you cannot just undo this with local rotations. Mm -hmm. um, but this is something that we would have to dive in more to actually um, uh, unwrap because we found that uh, our model didn't fully capture uh, what was happening. I see. And um, maybe can you remind us again in the simplify model, just what does the driving scheme look like again here and how do you tune omega zero and omega two? Uh, yeah, so the driving scheme is that we drive the, uh, the control transmon at the frequency of the uh, of the target at the zero one frequency so it's a, uh, it's a regular cr cross resonance gate doing exactly what you would do for a cross resonance gate mm -hmm. but now we can say when you say the because target. there's multiple frequencies now per per you know qubit so <laughs> yes yeah so it's like the qubits were it, it's literally what you would do for a qubit gate but then we just prepare the control in two instead of one and we we see what, what happens and this is what happens oh. Um, tuning the zero and what and two to the same place, uh, that depends on the detuning, whether you can do that. And, uh, yeah, I mean, you would have to draw the level diagram. I don't have a good intuition there. Um, and I don't think even you can always do it. We just got lucky in these cases that we could reach that regime. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So as you can see, there's a lot of rich dynamics that we didn't explore here, and there's opportunity to uh, to improve on that. Um, we kind of took a different path there, um, which is we we used the natural uh, static interaction that the two qubits have, a cross Kerr interaction, that one can think of as two spin one uh, two spin ones interacting according to some Ising um, uh, Ising Hamiltonian, because the qubits are in the dispersive regime. So they only shift each other's levels. And in a doubly rotating frame, you can have all of these levels be um, degenerate. And only these four levels acquire some kind of phase. And the phase that they acquire here is given uh, in this table. It's in the order of a few hundred kilohertz, where the higher levels actually acquire phase more quickly, which is an effect from the bosonic enhancement, because these higher levels just interact more strongly. And so given that natural interaction Hamiltonian, in a way, this is already um, some kind of conditional phase gate. This is a, uh, a, natural, a natural evolution that you cannot undo with just local Z rotations. And so the idea is if we can tune this phase gate into something that we actually uh, is well defined and that we want to have, then we can turn this into a universal Qtrit gate. And we do that by having local permutations between um, uh, uh, between levels here. So these are just local pi pulses on the 0, 1 and the 1, 2 subspaces. And if you find um, a good combination of permutations and wait times, it turns out that you get some linear algebra system that you can actually solve for arbitrary phases. It's not guaranteed that it's going to be very fast, but you can solve it in this case. And so this is what we've done. We shuffle 
all of these uh, interactions, such that different levels require different phases. And then we change the wait times between these, uh, uh, these times. And then knowing the interaction strength, we know which level requires which phase. And this way we can imprint an arbitrary diagonal phase gate on our system. Very similar to your qubit C phase gate, there exists a conditional phase gate in Qtrit land that just by sandwiching it between Hadamards turns the C phase gate into the Qtrit version of a C naught, which is called a C sum, which is conditionally on the state of the target, just adds one to the um, uh, to the control. Sorry, add however we had in control to the target. And so we implemented that gate and also did uh, randomized benchmarking on that gate, finding that we get a fidelity of 0 0.85 in a gate time that was about one and a half microseconds. Now, this gate is not very fast, so it's limited by T1. Uh, it is protected from noise because actually these permutations do some dynamical decoupling. Um, and uh, the other benefit is that it actually acts in the full Qtrit, two Qtrit subspace. So it's a genuine two Qtrit gate. I think we have another question. Uh, you began to address it, which is what says the rate limit on the gate here? Yeah, so this is the interaction strength. Um, and uh, I don't think that I didn't solve for arbitrary interaction strength how long this is going to take, right? What we ended up doing is solving some linear algebra problem. And so an important note is that you are not guaranteed that this is going to be really fast, right? Um, it might be that there is a solution, but if these coefficients, these alpha 1, 1, 1, 2, 2, 1, and 2, 2, turn out to be um, not working in your favor, uh, it might, you might end up with a, uh, with a slow gauge using this. Mm. And um, I guess if you want to, and yeah, and uh, can you say something about the on-off ratio, so to speak, <laughs> of the gate in terms of yes. having... Yeah, go on. So the the uh, the interaction is always on here, right, during the gate, and uh, that means that if you do not want this gate to happen, you need to do something about it. Uh, either compile the interaction when the uh, into your algorithm, or and that's the beauty of this particular gate, dynamical decouple. But because there are these pipe pulses here on both of these Qtrits. It turns out, and we actually found this in an algorithm that I will show you on some of the next slides, that an idling Qtrit here, to some extent, is naturally decoupled from the static interaction that it has. So that is really a big feature in that, the, the, because the nature of the gate is using dynamical decoupling protocols that, in principle, have the capability to decouple, so actually turn the gate off, if you will. Um, generalizing this is tricky, though. Uh, like coming up with a way to uh, that it always works is something that I've not done, but I think that that would be an interesting thing to do. So if you wanted a delay instruction for some reason, then then you could do it stroboscopically. Essentially, you would need to be at some interval times, and you would essentially be applying this this gate in such a way so as to get your control phase to be zero. Um, and uh, remind me, what sets T again? How is T determined? Capital T in the Top. Yeah, so this is a very particular solution where actually the time between the gates, uh, between the pulses, was the same for every um, uh, for every delay. That doesn't have to be the case. But what we do is we uh, we define our target controlled phase, right, which was which gives a set of nine phases that you want, mm -hmm. and then you, given your pulse sequence, you write out what every state gets in terms of a phase as it undergoes. Um, pre-evolution and these permutations. And that sets up a big linear algebra matrix that you can just solve. And that's how we find these times. And you solve it for these coefficients here. OK. Um, got, got it, part of the solution. And um, maybe you mentioned, but is, is there an, an alternative way to do uh, these universal gates with just applying many tones at once? Or is that something that's too tricky to you know calibrate and tune up? Uh, that, that's on our to-do list. Yeah, that's that's my outlook. Awesome. Good. Thank you. Yeah. So with that, I've showed you how we did one particular uh, implementation. This was the first implementation of having a universal Qtrit processor. 
Uh, we did this for five Q trades, and as you see, we also have the way to benchmark it. Um, I think it is already mentioned that there's lots of ways in which we can move forward, but given this new toy that we had, we wanted to actually ask a question, can we now use it for some algorithm? And that brings me to the next part of my talk, which is we wanted to see if we could study the scrambling of quantum information using these q -trits. Uh How long do I have, Rafshi? Oh, 20 minutes. 20 minutes? Okay, good. Uh, yeah, my timer is off there. Um, so we wanted to use this new q -trit processor to do some fun physics, and we landed on scrambling. Uh, which is a many-body phenomena. Um, in our case, many means two, uh, because we are still small in size. Um, but the idea of scrambling is that it is the very rapid spread of quantum information across all degrees of freedom of a system. So here, I kind of pictorially draw something that is a many-body system. Every dot is a site. It could be a qubit, a qtrit, or something. And if you have information initially um, localized here, then the scrambling operation would, under unitary evolution, very quickly make localized information spread out over the whole system. So it very quickly entangles with everything. And the physics of scrambling connects to, for instance, dynamics in black holes, as uh, people think, or in um, condensed matter systems. And this is why recently uh, there is a large growing community that is interested in studying scrambling in quantum information processors. So we tried to do this in a Qtrit circuit where we were able to have a five Qtrit quantum circuit that uh, uses actually, as we will see in just a second, quantum teleportation to verify that you have successfully scrambled quantum information. And the thing, the operator that we verify is the scrambling between two Qtrits. So how do I define scrambling a little bit more rigorously? One can define for this work, this is what we do, a scrambling unitary to be a unitary operator that acts on two qtrits and that scrambles if every single qtrit Pauli operator is being mapped to a two-body operator if you take the Heisenberg picture. Right? So you can ask yourself, how does any operator evolve under this unitary evolution? Pictorially, I draw it like this. If you have a local operator, so for instance, a Pauli acting only on this right particle or only on this left one, if you then look at how the Heisenberg representation of this operator under unitary evolution looks like, if it only contains two body terms, then we, for every single local operator, then we say that the information is scrambled. Mathematically, we can write it like this, right? We can write the Heisenberg evolved operators, the local ones, as a sum of an arbitrary uh, or like a, of a complete set of Pauli operators. And then if all of the terms here are two body operators for every input, then we say that we have scrambled. Yeah. And note that often people also will ask this as a function of time of the unitary operator. We do not do that here. It's like a bang, bang protocol. We apply you and we ask, has the information scrambled or not? Just because of the nature of the experiment. Yeah. So then we needed to find a way to actually decompose the scrambling unitary. This is an example of a 2 q trits Clifford scrambler. Um, you can define it in terms of these indices, and you can check for yourself that every local Pauli here is mapped to a two-body. Actually, this one has the very special property that it just maps to a single two-body Pauli operator. Um, it could also be a sum. Um, and the way that we can decompose this unitary scrambler is by two C sums back to back with the target and the control swapped. So this is really nice because we've shown you how we can do a C sum. And if we just do two of them, we actually, with reverse ordering, we have our scrambler. And it turns out that actually Qtrits are the smallest possible system to find two body scrambling. If you have two qubits, you don't have a sensical definition of scrambling. So um, that speaks to the richness of the Qtrit uh, Hilbert space. You can do it with three qubits, though. So in characterizing this, we actually first, an intuitive way of doing this, to me at least, is to actually do process tomography, which is pretty demanding if you do this on a two Qtrit system. It takes hours and hours, uh, many, many measurements, but we managed to do this. 
And if you plot two putrid process tomography in a very particular way, there's a very instructive way in which you can see how the scrambling happens. So let's think about that for a second. The data that we plot here is what's called the Pauli transfer matrix, which essentially has the same information as any other matrix that you get from uh, quantum process tomography. But it arranges the information in such a way that it's really instructive to think about on the y-axis an input, which is the input operator, and on the, um, on the x-axis here, how this is represented in terms of all the other uh, operators after it is evolving under the unitary that you're trying to characterize. Yeah? So it's kind of measuring this mapping from input to output. And for a single line here, you can read off what every input Pauli operator maps onto when it evolves under this unitary. And for a local gate, you would expect every input to stay local on every input. So you see a Pauli G identity maps to a Pauli G identity. There's no two qubit operations here. But if you do this for an entangling gate, oh, and so I ordered maybe one node. Usually this is an 81 by 81 dimensional uh, matrix, but I don't consider all the two body inputs because for scrambling, we want to know what the local operators do. So I cut off a large part of this matrix and I ordered it in such a way that the single q operators are all on the left side here and the two body operators are on the right. Yeah. So this is kind of our map for where operators move when they evolve under this unitary. If we do this for an entangling gate, you can see that some of the local operators actually become non-local. And that is a signature of entanglement. But some of the local operators still stay in the local subspace, which is maybe equivalent to saying that an entangling gate doesn't create entanglement for every input state, but then for operator language. However, if we do this for a scrambling unitary, we really see that every local input operator gets mapped to a two-body operator, and in particular, a single one. This is the theory, this is the experiment. And so this is a way to kind of see or get an intuition for how operators are being scrambled throughout the system. Yeah. So I personally find this really beautiful. You can, if you understand this, you literally see the scrambling happen. But from a practical point of view, it's really terrible because we just characterized a two-body operator and it took us hours to measure it and it just doesn't scale. So if we're interested in studying scrambling in more interesting settings, we're never going to do quantum process tomography. So I we need another I'll way. Just, I'll just inject my uh, comment that the data looks beautiful. Well, thank you. It did take a lot of time to measure this. So uh, that's what <laughs> I'll appreciate it. Yeah. Yeah, that's really nice. Um, good. Yeah, so the next thing that we set out to do is to ask, can we verify that we've scrambled without doing this huge overhead? Of Maybe one quick question. Process. Yes. It looks like the background is different. Is that just some, is that representing data? You know, as you look at the single body yeah. in qubit one versus qubit two versus the two body terms, the backgrounds are different. Yeah. Uh, I guess yeah. that's not data, that's just highlighting the regions. No, absolutely. You're absolutely right. And I, uh, I debated myself a long time whether uh, I, uh, this is justified and I just think that it's, it's so much more intuitive to look at it. And I tried to pick the colors in such a way that it doesn't hide anything, but, uh, yes, there, there is two colors overlapping. Um, yes. I can appreciate the painstaking decision-making process of color choices. Um, <laughs> and, uh, I, I mean, the data looks beautiful. Is there also, a, yeah. Can you tell us, is there a a way you quantified this as well in terms of you know cross fidelities or anything like that? Yeah, 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 absolutely. So the uh, this has been a long time. So you can calculate the process fidelity from this. I think the local gate process fidelity is a little lower than what we would have expected based on the randomized benchmarking. I'm remembering like a one or two percent error, which we attribute to the overhead associated with doing all of this, right? So these processes are, first of all, we average over a day. So um, yeah, uh, any drift could make an imperfection there. And then also spam errors actually come into play here, whereas in randomized benchmarking, they don't. The entangling gate matched very nicely, I think, with the, um, the, uh, the number that we got from, uh, from a randomized benchmarking, somewhere in the order of uh, 10, 12%. And then the scrambler actually came out a little bit high, I believe. It was like 85% or 82% or something. So it was not just a multiplication of two entangling gates. And that 
was a little bit of a question why that's the case. I think there might be some actually undoing of errors and phase accumulation due to some symmetries. We've never fully understood where uh, that came from, but um, in principle, yes, you can read in the paper and find all the process fidelities that we found. Uh, and uh, we understand them to some degree. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Thank you. All right. So if we just want to answer, though, the question, have we scrambled yes or no, it turns out that there is another verification protocol that is beautiful in the sense that it was one of the first demonstrations where uh, scrambling was verified without doing something really complex. There's many, many ways in which you can verify it. It has to do with forward and backward um, uh, evolution of the Hilbert space. We did quantum process tomography, but all of those methods have problems. And this particular protocol is a verification protocol uh, where the idea is that you have a single cutrate here that you prepare in a state psi, and then you run a protocol that is going to teleport by creating entangled pairs here and then creating a unitary evolution that is scrambling and performing a measurement and based on the measurement performing some feedback such that magically if everything goes well the state here is teleported and comes out at the other end and could you tell us coming back to this question of uh, idle times in say Qtrid one during the first you know few cycles of the circuit um but it has this always on zz interaction are you doing anything at at this stage such as dynamic with the coupling there or yes uh, i would say go to the supplementary uh, uh of our paper we have uh, i think at least four dynamical decoupling schemes that we intertwine such that uh we don't get any yeah uh to, to remove any idling errors but even also during the cross resonance gate uh remove any errors there i yeah. see and in, in just a slightly more technical question but in terms of um kind of the compilation of the circuit including all this because it's starting to get rather complex right to include all the dd sequences and do this um do you, are you using your own compiler or methodology or do you have something that you're leveraging uh, yeah so uh, both the uh, student work on this, Vinay Ramesh and myself, we have two uh, uh, dynamical decoupling compilers in our head. Uh, <laughs> and we literally did that. Uh, so we did educated guesses, and based off those, we um, we came up with protocols. So it was all intuition, which I think, uh, yeah, shows the power of dynamical decoupling and clever thinking, but also does show the weakness because we did not compile a completely generalized uh, algorithm in that sense. But actually, some of the steps are close. So some of the dynamical decoupling would have worked for arbitrary idling, for instance. Like, we didn't do it state specifically. Mm -hmm. But definitely, there is an opportunity there to either compile that or understand that in a, in a deep way. Yeah. Great. Thank you. And I will say that part of this, actually, part of our trouble, and this is what I will say towards the end as well, is that there is actually a beautiful understanding of dynamical decoupling in terms of Qtrids, but it requires the native gates. And we don't have like native Qtrid gates. And our native mm -hmm. gate set was more like swapping operations, which actually has used problems for dynamical decoupling. So I think going towards like genuine Qtrid operators, the dynamical decoupling becomes much easier. For instance, a Han echo for a Qtrid is just three X pulses with three waiting times instead of two. And that, that can do decoupling. So, mm. yeah. So for now, we wanted to verify that when this successful teleportation happens, it turns out that you can bound the question, did you scramble or not? And it actually does so via the out of time ordered correlators that I will not be talking about today. Um, and so what we did is we ran this protocol for various input states and then measure here the output state when the measurement was uh, heralding the success of the teleportation, very similar, but then for a larger system as you would for three qubits, for instance, and then we plot all the fidelities of the teleported states for various input states and find that the average teleportation fidelity is way above the classical bound for Qtrid teleportation, which is one third. So that's what you would do if you would just randomly guess any state here. You would find an average fidelity of one third and we are way above that. And then using this average teleportation fidelity, we can find a bound for the question, did we scramble or not connected through the out of time or the correlators? Um, and the answer was, Yes, to some degree. Uh, 
Now, there's much more to this uh, particular work than I have time to go into today. Um, there is one connection that I promised Slatko I would talk about, so I'm just going to flash it because uh, if you are into high energy physics or uh, maybe quantum gravity, um, there's a connection to black holes here. Um, the protocol was actually inspired by work earlier by Kitaev and Yoshida and also Preskill by the black hole information paradox. So if you are willing to think out of the box for a little bit and think of the scrambling operator as something that would have happened in a black hole, where information is really densely packed and everything is interacting really strongly, and there's good quantum gravity reasons to believe that that's actually what a black hole does, then you can interpret this protocol as Alice throwing in a state into a black hole and Bob having an entangled black hole and collecting Hawking radiation as the heralding measurement for successful teleportation to a reference state that is here outside of the black hole. So what Bob does is he makes an EPR state, throws half of the pair in this black hole on the other end, and then teleports the state out through the Hawking radiation. And to me, this, uh, this particular uh, interpretation, and uh, I understand Q-trits now, and I understand teleportation, and I didn't know anything about black hole physics, but the fact that you can start talking about that in terms of quantum information language has been a really nice exploration for me and getting in touch with people who know a lot about it. And suddenly, the quantum information language starting to creep up there, it's just an extremely exciting uh, prospect to me, with the understanding that uh, we did not simulate black holes, right? We just looked at scrambling in a protocol that was inspired from those discussions. However, maybe in the future, you know, if we can make larger and larger quantum systems, who knows, maybe we can do interesting quantum simulations and learn something there. Yeah. On the more technical side, I have one other uh, statement about the scrambling. Um, there is another experiment who did this in ion traps. And I think an interesting resource comparison is that they actually did this in a seven qubit ion trap using all to all connectivity. And so what I did is I just made a, um, a comparison first asking the question, if we would have had qubits and seven qubits in a line, how many gates would we have needed? And the answer was we would have needed 40, uh, 54 two qubit gates for this. Having five qubits in a line, we could do this with eight gates, um, sorry, uh, 14 gates. And if we would actually have genuine two Q-trit gates for both the state preparation and uh, scrambling, we could have even done it in eight, but we didn't. And comparing to what the ion trap experiment did with all-to-all -all connectivity, they could do it in 16 gates. And you can kind of see how if you want to have very strong interactions and you only have limited connectivity, right, you kind of have to start doing all these swaps. But in a way, this higher complexity of the Q-trit space kind of gives you a, a handle there to actually do it with limited connectivity. And some of the complexity that you win in terms of other protocols with Qtrids, they kind of use that same feature, right? So I, I don't want to say that it's exactly the same or exactly equivalent, but it's some comparison of resources that I think warrants more interest and in looking into uh, more deeply. And then I should also mention that there's a lot of recent interest into looking uh, uh, scrambling in the experimental community. Uh, and here's just a list of a few papers uh, in a variety of systems that looked into information of uh, scrambling with quantum information. All right. So with that, I think I'm almost running out of time. I have an outlook and maybe one or two slides on my work that we are uh, going to do in the future, if Slatko permits me. Uh, yes, Mahil, please go ahead. Uh, so I actually started a little bit with an outlook, which is to say that there is much excitement nowadays in the experimental community to try to make QTRIT and QDIT experiments work. Uh, just in the past two years, I've seen a lot of papers coming out on superconducting circuits. You can even do Qtrid logic now on the IBM cloud. Um, Regetti announced that they're going to make their ATQ Qtrid processor available, although I've not seen a, a publication yet. And other platforms are also coming up with universal gates in uh, those kind of systems. And so immediate next questions that we have specifically for superconducting circuits, is that how can we improve the gate fidelity here? Specifically, the two Qtrid gate fidelity is not as high as we would want to. Can we actually go to higher circuits there? 
And there we expect a trade-off between noise and the efficiency gain. So that's an open question. Where is the optimal spot? Where should you stop? And then another question is this benchmarking. When and how do you compare the advantages that you get? And then in the somewhat longer future, I'm really excited to see if we can get information protocols using QDIT advantages that are predicted from theory. Maybe we can use these systems, nonlinear encodings, um, as kind of a different way of getting continuous variable uh, quantum information processing, where most of the work so far has been on doing this in linear systems, harmonic oscillators, long-lived cavities, and then coupling a nonlinearity for the control. Maybe if you encode the information in a nonlinear oscillator right away, you can have some advantages there. And I'm also excited about thinking of what these different kind of QDIT simulations could give you. And one example is we showed that our gate can be thought of as an icing one spin one interaction. There were a lot of questions about the idling errors. If you set up your Hamiltonian in a way that the idling time for uh, which is an error for digital computation is actually what you want for uh, analog simulation, then maybe there's interesting uh, things to do there. So those are the lines that we're thinking along. One very direct thing that we would like is actually directly generating the rotations of Q-trits. As I told you, what we've done so far was sequential pulsing of subspaces 0, 1, and 1, 2. And then you get these kind of gate constructions that require many gates and kind of sequentially drive the two transitions. We are currently working on directly generating the rotation matrix of the Hadamard. And the way that we do it is using detuned pulses uh, without the need to actually drive the 0 to 2 transition. And there's a very nice analogy to how you do this in qubits, where you can actually also drive directly, generate the Hadamard rotation by detuning your pulse by exactly the same amount as you have the Rabi frequency. And it's not completely clear why this turns out to be the case. But in Qtrits, there turns out to be the same trick. And this is data that my PhD student sent me 20 minutes before the talk, where for a square pulse, we actually got pretty good agreement of doing this for a Hadamard pulse for one particular input state, um, showing that you drive like an initial state to some superposition of all three states. Uh, and so we're really excited to see where we can, uh, where we can go with that. We are thinking about climbing the Transmon ladder uh, where we anticipate that the noise in the higher levels might be a problem. If you just think about the energy relaxation, actually the T1 becomes shorter and shorter as you go higher up the ladder due to bosonic enhancement. But the upshot, as we've already seen in the Kerr Hamiltonian, the interactions also become stronger. So maybe the gate times also become faster and we don't know, like maybe that's a, a, that might turn out to be not so bad a thing. Um, the phase noise will definitely increase. Uh, and so the charge dispersion is something that you need to take care of as you go higher and higher. And so that requires some tweaking of the transmon parameters. And we believe that by increasing further the EJ over EC ratio, we can become um, more and more insensitive to charge dispersion. And we're starting to make some plots of that and thinking about how we would uh, do that in practice. It comes at the, uh, the downside of decreasing the anharmonicity. So maybe we would have to do more pill shaping to make sure we don't run into frequency spacing problems. And at some point, that method will break down. But we know for q it's already been really good. So why not go a little bit higher and see where it gets us? So we already have designs to do this. This is a design that we send out this week to Lincoln Labs, where we are in a program called Squill Foundry, where uh, this is supported by LPS. And we can submit designs, and then they're going to fabricate this for us. And we have these designs for um, uh, really QDIT transmon uh, operations. And we're excited to start measuring those. So with that, uh, I would like to thank you for your attention. I should mention that a lot of this work has been done at UC Berkeley, pointing out specifically our um, dynamical decoupling compiler, Vene Ramachez and uh, Alexi Morfan, who worked on the QTRIT randomized benchmarking. Both of them are now at Google in different departments. Um, and acknowledge my group, Dre Parker, who has worked on the Qtrit Hadamard. And I didn't have time to talk about this, but we have another experiment going on in our lab, which is trying to couple high impedance geometric spiral resonators um, to spin qubits, working together with the gate-defined spin, uh, spin qubit lab. And uh, Mihirengi is working on this, and she will present her work uh, at March meeting. And so 
Finally, let me say that we are always looking for excited people. We have an open postdoc position available. Um, and feel free to reach out if you're interested in that or any more of the work. And with that, let me thank you for your attention. Thank you very much, Mahel, for the wonderful talk and also congratulations on the beautiful results. Um, we do have a few questions from the audience. Maybe first, can you comment on the connection between the scrambling and thermodynamics from Deepon? Is there a thermodynamics or thermodynamic parameter related to the scrambling unitary? Um, or were the thermodynamic parameters signifying growth of the scrambling unitary in analogy with the black ball? Maybe you make 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 of that question what you can, <laughs> the way I read it. <laughs> Yeah, so this is why I'm always hesitant to bring up this connection to uh, uh, to black holes and uh, thermodynamics because I, I I would have deferred this to to some of my theory collaborators who probably know way more about this than uh, than I do. I am exposed to this field to some extent. Uh, I think I've heard some of these words, but I wouldn't be able to come up with a very concise and precise answer. I don't know, Sletko, maybe you have a, uh, a somewhat better idea than I do on this. Sounds like a great invitation for a follow up seminar. Uh, I'll jump into the next question. I would watch is, that. Yes. <laughs> Does the virtual Z gate in Qtrit perform slightly different for qubits? Uh, it will add phases to the two state, for, ex for example, state one and two rather than state one and add a phase to state one in the qubit. So maybe if you could just comment more on the virtual Z gate in the, in the Qtrit and yes. how is it differing from the qubit case? Yes, so that is exactly right. Um, the short version is it works. You have enough degrees of freedom because you have two microwave drives at different transitions and you only have two phases that you need to set because you can pick one for free and therefore it works. However, um, it is completely right that you have to be very careful in deciding how an update of your microwave phase actually translates into what type of Z gate you have. And so, I think the description was exactly right. Uh, when you update your microwave phase here, you don't just give a phase to the one level, but also one to the two. But then um, because the updating the phase of the one to two transition kind of gives you that same effect, but on the other two levels, in the end you have two degrees of freedom that are enough to, to tune it. And so if you want to tune a single level, you actually have to update the phase of both of these. Um, and so as long as you do that uh, linear algebra correctly, it turns out that you have universal control. So in my mind, it's the same, but you have to be precise about what the exact gate is that you have natively. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And another way of thinking about this is that, is that it is a frame update, right? The, the phase of the microwave drive is essentially choosing what frame you're working in. And you can think of them as two separate frames that you can make degenerate or you can make them any virtual energy you want by just updating those frames. But they are coupled together because they share a level, and that's why it's slightly tricky. Hmm. Perfect. Thank you. And um, this was an earlier question that I missed at the beginning of the talk, but are there some uh, general statements on the relative cost factor for uh, circuits with qtrids versus qubits uh, with respect to circuit complexity? So maybe you could comment yes. on that. Yeah on that? That's an excellent question. Um, and I do not remember, I think there's actually in the, uh, I'm trying to pull up the slide because there's the references there and then where was Yeah, sorry, this was a question from earlier that, that we just yeah. didn't get to. Yeah, so um, I, I invite you to read this particular review here, QDITS and High Dimensional Quantum Computing, because it does an excellent job at both trying to explain all the complexity scalings that are understood and also point out research that's been done. It's fairly recent. Um, I think that there are like there are decompositions of arbitrary Q trid rotations versus Q bit rotations, and they have been shown to have some kind of advantage, but it's not that overwhelming. However, I mean, there's still a scaling advantage, but I cannot say for every circuit, this is what you win because it really depends on actually going into the details. And for instance, you do get a strong um, uh, gate depth uh, scaling advantage here for this particular case, which is decomposing the Q trit Paulis 
uh, sorry, the Qtrid uh, totally gates um, using Qtrids. And there's two ways in which you can do that. You can either fully encode this in Qtrids or just use the third level as kind of like a helper level. And uh, you can see that for that particular case, this was the scaling advantage that was shown. But I think it's just really hard to give a single number. In my experience, every paper that looked into it found some significant advantage. And I should point out the error correction advantage for magic state distillation because uh, it actually gives orders of magnitude improvement in uh, terms of gate count and a strong reduction in the error thresholds. So I think there's good reason to be excited, but I cannot make like a, a very precise statement of you will win X always or something. Wonderful. With the um, two qubit gates, the control gates, um, the CX gates, uh, usually there are a lot of challenges in the regular architecture with having the qubits be really close in frequency or having a lot of spectator errors uh, on neighboring qubits or neighboring levels. Um, I, I guess here we could, you know, we didn't have time to get into it too much, but it sort of looked like everything just worked. So I wonder if uh, if there's a lot more to say there about spectator errors and some of these other multi-qubit crosstalk errors and so forth. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. So um, the first thing I can comment on is that in the randomized benchmarking, we did actually measure the idling errors if you don't try to do uh, uh, like just for single Qtrid gates. And so uh, that does give you some reduction, but it was not huge. And actually most of that came from the particular architecture, not from frequency overlap. So we were working with a chip that I'm having a hard time uh, reading everybody's crosstalk errors these days. Um, but uh, from what I gather, uh, it seems like other processors have less crosstalk. And so I would expect a lot of those errors to go away. That's for single Qtrids though. Um, if you use a fixed transmon architect, fixed uh, frequency transmon architecture, there are frequency uh, crowding issues and overlap uh, like idling Qtrid uh, potential errors. And there's actually a paper by Alexi Morval and the Berkeley group that's on archive that talks about these challenges as you try to scale up. And they showed that um, if you just do the cross resonance gate in the way that we post it, it becomes a problem. But if you include another gate and they, for instance, came up with a um, conditional phase gate that you can also do in a fixed frequency architecture, uh, that it significantly uh, relieves the, um, uh, the constraints, and actually it seems doable to scale this up for frequency um, uh, transmonds. So there is a path, and I should also add that I'm maybe more excited about the idea to have genuine Qtrid interactions, because I just think that if you have those rich dynamics, um, that might be beneficial, and maybe you need to go to something like a tunable coupler for that. Thank you, Mahel. I think we're 15 minutes over with questions. Um, this was, really, again, really nice talk. Very nice results. I love the analogy to black holes. I'm sure we'll have lots more. And the introduction. Uh, I'd like to thank you very much for coming on the Kiskit seminar. Thank you very much for having me. It's a pleasure. And folks, it has been a real pleasure having you here with us today. Thank you for yeah, tuning in. Yeah, lots of good in. questions. Thanks. Exactly. Um, feel free to continue discussing in the chat. And uh, if you have questions outstanding, you can go back and rewind this talk. Uh, this talk will stay recorded and live on the Kiskid YouTube seminar channel. You can subscribe to see what talks are coming up. And with that, folks, and Machio, thank you very much. We will see you next week at noon Eastern time.